G'day, welcome to Bent Brills Live, proudly brought to you by Ben Spake Brewing Co. Been a few weeks since we've done one of these Bent Brills Live sessions. Um, as brewers, we all love talking about beer, so I'm, I feel really good sitting here tonight. And what a better day to be doing it on than IPA day. So um, hope everyone out there has um, been enjoying some of the great uh, hoppy beers um, that the craft beer breweries around Australia are putting together at the moment because there's certainly a really great range out there. Um, just remember tonight, fire in your questions. You're going to be able to win some merch packs from some of our um, guests. And speaking of guests, we've got two cracking um, cracking guests on the show tonight, two, two brewers that are really passionate about um, doing everything as best as they can and making some damn good IPAs at the same time. I might also add they're really good blokes as well. So big welcome to Dave Patton and from Akasha and Scotty Hargrave from Bolta. Um, we'll come to them really, really soon. But first of all, just thought I'd do my little round again. Just remember that these lids, unfortunately, these 60 de 360 degree lids, we're losing these. Um, we can't actually get them anymore at the moment because the suppliers stopped making them in the US. But uh, And also the New South Wales government's given us a bit of a serve and said, no, you can't put them on your cans anymore. So we're going to fight that. Um, we really love these um, can lids. We reckon that um, you can see the beer, you can smell the beer, and you can taste the beer so much better than out of a traditional can. But we're sort of stuck with these traditional cans at the moment, and they don't go too bad either. Um, so we might get into the show Dave and Scotty, welcome to Ben Brewers Live. Thanks for having us. Um, Dave, we might start with you. Uh, maybe you'd like to tell a few people how you actually got into beer. It's a pretty good place to start. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me, and um, great to be on the show. And well, um, I've been into into beer for a little while now. I, I think. Like a few of us, we kind of feel like a bit of a few old salts in this game, but it hasn't been that long, really. I think um, back in, you know, I, I haven't been a brewer my entire life. I spent the, about the first 15 years of my career uh, working for uh, big American IT companies. And um, part of the, the beauty of that was to spend a fair bit of time over in the States. And as most of us know, and most of those who like hoppy beers, that that IPA movement, or IPA movement, 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 or even the craft beer movement itself, was, uh, moved, was, uh, yeah, sort of took off a bit earlier over there. Over there, so, so, earlier over there uh, so, lucky enough to spend some, uh, time, enough to spend some time in the um, states. Um, you know, really started to really started to, to taste some of the to taste uh, some of the beers that were uh, available at the time. Things like Sierra Nevada, Sierra Nevada, the usual classics, the usual classics that we still know about today, still available today. Did that for a few years. Did that for a few years. Started home brewing. Started home brewing. Fifteen years ago now, probably about fifteen years ago now. Really fell in love with. Really fell in love with drinking of the beer, but not just the Drinking of the beer, but really that process. I've got a bit of a science background and, and fell in love with the process of brewing beer pretty early. Um, ended up brewing a lot of beer, giving away a lot of beer, drinking a lot of beer, and um, you know, found I wasn't too bad at it either. And um, sort of what we call a midlife crisis, but sort of in my sort of late thirties, decided that well, you know, you know what, I might just give this a crack. And um, some of you guys might have heard of a, a brewery called Riverside Brewing that I co-founded back, I think it was about two thousand eleven. Um, went and uh, went on a little trip down to Melbourne and um, bought a second-hand brew from a brewery called Mountain Goat, who I'm sure everybody knows. Um, put it on the back of a truck, brought it to Sydney and started a brewery. And the rest is history, as they say. So we uh, we did that. Um, that went really well for us. That we again, we we I, I fell in love with IPAs when I was home brewing and when I was travelling around the states and um, really started brewing big, big bold you know, seven, eight, nine percent IPAs from the outset. And um, wasn't a lot of them around at that stage, but um, really uh, got a got a bit of a cult following pretty quickly with that brewery and um, left there around 2015 and started Akasha and sort of continued that trend of, of um, hop forward beers, um, a little bit better at it, a little bit more refined, but uh, really that same sort of, um, that same sort of uh, feeling of, of good quality hop forward beers. And um, here we are today. Yeah, awesome. Um, Scotty, um, thanks for coming on, mate. Um, maybe you'd like to tell everyone your little story about getting into beer. That has got to be, um, that's got to be the saying for 2020, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, some poor, some poor kid's going to get called that, mute. 
<laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, Rich, you were you were there at the early days. I actually, um, I developed, a, I guess, a fascination with new beers around the the um, the turn of the century or the millennium. Um, from memory, little uh, little creatures pale had just sort of. Um, been available on the East Coast. That was somewhere around 2000, I think. And Chuck Hunt had just done the first of the James Squire beers, and I thought they were really good. And <clears throat> for some reason, as a concreter playing in a sort of heavy metal band in Canberra and drinking lots of Melbourne bitter cans, I somehow found the urge to um, wander off the path and have a look at some different beers. And it sort of went from there. And um, I can remember for years and years sort of just digging out German um, wheat beers and, you know, the Ho Gardens and, and Belgian, um, you know, other, other sort of Belgian beers and, and a couple of sort of really oxidised American beers when I could get them. And I did all that for about five years and just annoyed all my family and friends with all these new beers that they couldn't stand anyway. And um, eventually uh, uh, at your old haunt, mate, at the, uh, at the Wigan Pen, <laughs> um, I did a, a half-day adult education course with uh, with Lockie um, on the history of beer, and after he sort of rant about excise, he sort of started to explain the history of beer, and I was hooked. And met you very shortly after at the Canberra Brewers Club, and and sort of went from there. And um, within a within a few months, had had some hand-me-down um, brewing equipment from the likes of yourself and and Gary. Gary Picker and and Stagger and a couple of the other old Canberra boys and away I went yeah and uh, uh, yes I didn't know I was a brewer but uh, I guess I found that out around 2006 2007 and um, and just for the folks that are out there Rich uh, I've got to say it was really pivotal in uh, playing a role in me becoming uh, a professional brewer because. Um, he, he actually gave me quite a lot of encouragement and um, thank you, mate. Hats off to this day for that, for uh, for saying, you know what, if you're making beer like this in your shed, you might as well get out there and have a crack and um, <laughs> that's what's sort of happened. So, you know, um, again, mate, there's always, there's, always, there's always a beer for you at my place, mate. <laughs> no worries. Um... So we are here celebrating IPA Day. Um, sorry, everyone out there, for the sound problems we had right at the start. We are doing Vent Brewers Live. Um, we've got Dave Patton from Acasta and Scotty Hargrave from Bolter here. We're talking all things hops and all things IPA. And, Scotty, why do you reckon IPA is so popular? I, I don't know, mate. I think, I think in part that IPA has come to represent good beer. I think people... When they see those three little letters now on a can, or a, or a, even a t-shirt, or a, or a, or a growler, or whatever, I think IPA has come to mean uh, not just craft beer, but I think in a way it's come to mean um, you know for for the vast majority of people that it actually stands for some somebody who gives a shit about their beer. It's I think it's more than just the beer itself. I think it's a badge that. That, that people see IPA as a like as a as a bit of a, a you know a pole star to aim at. Like you go into a you know if you go into a bar or a, a or a restaurant where you wouldn't normally expect to find great beer and they've got something something IPA on tap. You know whether it's a Acacia IPA or Ben Spoke or or uh, you know or a Mountain Goat IPA whatever. There's there's just that indication just right there on the drinks list that these folks. Uh, you know the venue owners give a, a little bit more of a shit about their beer than than somebody who wouldn't have IPA on the list. And I think um, I think right across the board, it's it's really come to stand for yeah for for good beer and and beer that's a, um, a little bit more important in people's lives. Let alone obviously that what we all know is the you know the DNA and the technical side of it, and the stylistic reasons why IPAs are what they are. But I, I think people have, particularly with the, you know, you, you'll allude to it later with um, hazies and stuff. I think people have really sort of staked a claim on IPA, meaning that whoever made this beer gives a shit. Yeah, I think um, I think you're right. I tend to totally support what you're saying. I think every brewery nowadays pretty well has an IPA. Um, 
I've also noticed a lot of breweries um, overseas outside of the US, so the likes of the UK and even in Europe, always seeming to have an IPA in their repertoire now as well. So it's sort of tending to move around the world. Dave, are you are you along those lines? Are you are you you've got similar comments of why IPA is so popular? I love that description, Scotty. By the way, that's uh, it's a real honest way of, of saying it, and I, and, I, and I completely agree with it. I think. I, look, IPA has been the, one of the most popular styles of craft for a long, long time, and I think the way the way that I look at it is, you know, 20 years ago, um, or even 30 years ago, before IPA was a thing, particularly in Australia, but it maybe even in the States, people weren't necessarily after that after flavour. Um, you know, whether it's you know, eating white bread or instant coffee or whatever else. I mean, that was a, that was just what everyone did, but. I think today people, whether it's what they're eating, what they're drinking, whether it's beer, coffee, food, whatever it is, people are after flavour and that's what we get from an IPA as well. Um, well I think we were saying before before we came on air, we all still love a, a good lager or a pilsner, but IPA just gives you that big flavourful punch and there's so many different, you know, it, we're not limited by the flavours either. There might be a big flavour punch, but there's so many different flavours, so many different hops and malts for that instant that go with it that um you know the the, the palate is is um is endless so i think it's that, that flavor thing as well i think people are after it um you know always people say oh yeah maybe it's the end of ipa this year but i don't think that's going to happen anytime soon dave have you got an ipa now yeah you, you're quietly having an ipa it'd be a bit wrong i was actually drinking a goza before i came on air i thought what the hell am i doing but uh no i have i've got a uh, little corbin ipa in my hand right now of course <laughs> And Dave, um, we, we're pretty lucky that we do get a lot of new hops coming out. I mean, obviously, IPA being hop-driven, um, a lot of IPAs have multiple different hops in providing, you know, a massive range of different flavours. And we do get these new hop varieties coming out. Um, do you, you do love seeing lots of new hop varieties and then figuring out how they're going to work in a beer? How, how do you go about um, coming up with a new... IPA or a new a new blend that you're going to put in um, one of your beers. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, we're seeing a lot more varieties. I think we're we're lucky that a lot of the growers, um, particularly in the states, um, but also here in Australia and other countries, are are really focusing on new hop varieties, particularly for use in IPA. So we're seeing a lot more over the last few years, which is great. Um, we 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 tend to not just throw a new hop in for the sake of it. So you'll you'll see a lot of classic IPA hops in our beers that we know and trust and and know them back the front. Um, but we don't want to be left behind either. So look, we you know the traditional sort of there's a it's it's good to have. I mean, we need good relationships with our uh, whether it's our wholesalers on the ground here or the growers over over in these in the states in particular. Um, to throw um, some new varieties our way and we we chuck them in a glass of hot water and make a hot tea or rub them and 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 we all always do that in a group situation no, not dissimilar to when we're tasting a finished beer we sit around a table we all have different um, different noses and different palates so we all get different things out of different hops but we'll sit around with some some new varieties that maybe not be named yet or, or new that have been commercially available for a little while and sit around and figure out which ones we like um, we're lucky to have a, a little brewery. We've got a little 300 litre brewery here. So what we'll we'll tend to do is pick one that we that we th we want to move forward with, um, and and nine times out of ten brew a single hop IPA with it with a with a malt base that we know that that um, is pretty light and um, will give us because sometimes you can smell a hop and you'll get pretty similar characteristics out of the beer itself, but sometimes you won't either. So. Um, sometimes you just got to get in there and brew with it and, and see what comes out at the other end. And you can't really put it put it in with other hops until you know what it's going to taste and smell like first. So we always do a single hop first. And then sometimes that single hop really stands out. Um, Sabro is a good example of that. Um, Sabro is just such a complex hop, throwing out all sorts of weird and wonderful shit we've never smelled before or tasted before. And um, we, we've, we released a commercial version of that um, a few months ago because we just loved it so much. Or it might be just lacking in a couple of different areas, but could be substituted or or mixed in with something else that we know know and love. And you're you've got that at the moment. You're having a taste of that. Maybe you'd like to just um, tell everyone about that beer in a little bit more specifics in terms of the flavours you're getting it getting in that beer, or people should expect the Sabro. Yeah, yeah, the Sabro is um, it's got all those classic sort of tropicals and and things that that we're, that everybody loves, but it's also got these kind of weird. Well, we thought we were the first because I was so different. Those sort of cream and, and mint and all sorts of really amazing flavours coming through um, that 
out of the, just this one single hop. Um, we also found as it ages, it, it, it throws different things as well. And we find that with a few different hops that, um, but yeah, that I think along with all those tropical uh, and fruit notes that everybody's loving at the moment, particularly in hazies and so forth, um, it's throwing a lot of those sort of cream and mint that we just, um, we're just loving at the moment. Yeah, great. And and Dave, have you been have you been lucky enough to go to a hop harvest, whether in Australia or um, um, in the US? Not at all. <laughs> it's one of well, those. I'm going to throw to Scotty now because um, <laughs> the question the question was, um, you know, how do you go about sourcing your hops and and playing around with new hops? And Scotty and I have been lucky enough to go to the hop harvest over in the US. Um, and I've been I've been to the one in Australia. I'm not sure if you've been to Australian hop harvest, Scotty, but um, different sort of. Um, way they go about it but certainly maybe you'd like to just um, have a bit of a chat about um, experiencing um, the hop harvest and the new hops that you you get to get to sniff and rub yeah i think um you know even even like dave was mentioning uh, a hop like sabro i think um i've made a i there's there's a couple of parts to it i guess um just looking at what how that hop ends up in the glass, say in a in a bolter beer. So I first met um, Jason Peralt, who's a breeder for um, Peralt Farms and the chief executive of um, Yakima Chief Ranches um, a couple of years ago in Melbourne. And he was talking about this new hop that was really weird because it had, as Dave mentioned, it had sort of cream, caramel colours, and um, and. Uh, mint, but also for me, a lot of coconut and a lot coconut, of coconut. Yeah, yeah, huge coconut and and um, and tangerine in it as well. And I, I just couldn't wait to just try what this weirdo hop was all about. Got to do that, and at the same time, there was this, uh, you know, there was the the initial emergence of brewed IPA. And when I when I sort of thought about, okay, so the idea of a really sparkling, super clean champagne really bloody ultra dry IPA and Sabro. Sabro was the only hop I could think about for that for that beer. Fast forward a little bit and I sort of took that idea um, forward and I, I made a bunch of brewed IPAs in our tap room and um, uh, ended up making a, a beer called Dry Haze, a collab with, um, with uh, our mates over at Garage Project at the start of the year and um, – that was actually uh, almost like a brute hazy. Um, that we, <laughs> but that beer was never, ever going to exist at all without Sabro. And, like, I'd, I'd built my version of what it was going to be. I wasn't going to do it. You know, Pete Gillespie, wonderful brewer, he wanted to do something really hazy. I wanted to do something that was really, really dry that, that would accentuate the, the brilliance that Sabro is. So we got together... Um, and we knew uh, this time last year when um, we were over at the hop harvest and we, we actually went to Jason's farm like we do most years and caught up with him and, and got to select the Sabro that we were going to put in this collaboration beer together. And we got talking to Jason and I'd, I'd sort of known this anyway, but he was sort of explaining it to Pete about how how this hop came around. And, like, he'd spent 12 or 15 years um uh, basically watching this hop year after year, and that's what goes into developing new varieties. It's a bloody long-term um, commitment. And the thing that really gets me about the hop harvest, which I suppose like, a, and, and you'd know, and, and particularly around new hops, is the commitment you've got to put into the the long haul to actually see something through. Yeah. And the fact that, that a guy like Jason Perrault 15 or 16 years ago thought coconut would be a good idea as a beer flavour or a flavour in beer, is this fucking pure genius? Sorry to swear, but it is. Like, who would have thought that back then? Like, it makes a lot of sense now, now yeah. later, but if you go back, you know, like a decade and a half and keep this little plant alive, um, you know, because it's this, it's this mutt thing with a, you know, not entirely fully known, like, hop, you know, like uh, lineage, no one knows exactly uh, what what the bloodlines are, for want of a better word, apart from that there's uh, Neo-Mexicanus, which is a wild American hop in it. I mean, it's just amazing that, that we we all get to make beers with this crazy flavour now because, uh, you know, 
uh, a hop breeder and a farmer that 15, 16, 18 years ago thought, yeah, that'll, <laughs> that'll taste good in beer. And for everyone out there, let's just put that into that timeline into perspective a little bit. I mean, when you're breeding hops, it's um, it starts off, you know, getting two different um, – uh, well, generally they use the same male, but definitely different females, to, uh, blending them together with um, different male. And it takes time to go from that, creating those seeds – to then um, propagating, going through all the testing and making sure that they're going to be a good um, a good breed to actually farm because that's obviously what the farmers are trying to do. They're trying to create hop varieties that do have good yields. They've got to be also resistant to um, moulds and mildews. Um, and this takes years to go through that process. And then finally when they get to that, that the end of the testing, so to speak, which can take as Scotty said, five, 10, 10 years to get to that, that time, then they've got to actually start propagating those up um, and getting those rhizomes in the ground. And generally speaking, the first year is an okay crop, but it's really after that when the rhizomes are developed. Um, Scotty probably knows a little bit more about that than me, actually. So, Scotty, well, how, how close was I? That's pretty well 15 years from start to finish. Yeah, it is. I think, like, you can start up with... Um you can start up with 40, 50,000 seeds, you know, or maybe 100,000 seeds and they'll plant um, as much of them as they can and they'll, like you say, they'll they'll just, it'll be, um, you know, they'll, they'll just, um, they'll sort them really quickly. They'll cull the vast majority in the first couple of years. So um, you're dead right. The agronomics have to make sense. Like it, you can't have a wonderful hop that is terrible to grow and is really difficult and is really susceptible to, to disease and a real, you know, really poor yields, you know, no farmer uh, is, is going to, you know, risk uh, their, their livelihood on something that, you know, 10 years down the track is still a real pain in the ass to grow and uh, might yeah. have other problems, you know. I mean, it's, it's obviously got to be a big part of it. You've got to have the farmers, uh, you know, just absolutely central to all of this. So, um it, it's it's a very long term thing, and then they've they've got to be able to believe it in in that hop as well, and it's got to grow. It's got to be easy to pick as well. Another big thing that folks out there might not um, really realise is that hops have a really small window of harvest, and it gets increasingly hard to fit uh, all of the hop uh, throughput that needs to go through um, all the processing um, to get hops. Uh, you know. Um, processed and ready to use in brewing um, through a very small window that of, of a you know a picking time that might be six weeks yeah. at the most you know and you've got you've got to get let's say all the hops in the the, the Pacific Northwest where we're all familiar with um, you know you've got to get like um, you know all of all of that season's harvest through the eye of a needle in the space of six weeks um, you know from um, it's it's a massive effort to juggle all of those uh, logistics to be able to get not just the right hop in the ground and have the right farmers growing it in the right places, but when it comes down to it, it likes, it's getting it back in from the field and getting it back in time because um, hops degrade. You know that they'll there'll be an optimum um, they'll reach their peak out in the field at a particular a picking window that they'll have and. If you're too far on either side of what that optimum picking window is, then you don't have the hops uh, present the way that they really are at their best, you know. And it's, it's it's an incredibly difficult thing. I think all farming is bloody hard, but um, hops seem to be particularly hard because it doesn't take much, you know, as we know um, um, here locally, you know, from uh, all the HBA folks and, and the Ryefield folks and all these um, – all these guys that are committed to doing great things down here as well, like Mother Nature, um, uh, when she gives you a slap, it's a, it's a fair old slap normally, and and hops are particularly susceptible as well to changes in weather and um, you know weather events that happen around harvest time. So it's a pretty precarious thing. So uh, yeah, it's great. A um, couple of questions that have come through. Um, we know Dave Patton's having a sabro, one of the Akasha sabros. I've got a Bolter IPA. I'm sort of sharing with a sprocket, a crankshaft, and a um, an Akasha mosaic IPA. Scotty, what do you what do you got there? 
Oh, I've got a dimples. I've got a little bit of dimples left. So that was, uh, that's a beer that features, uh, there's no Sabro on this, but it's got a couple of other uh, Yakima, Yakima hops, uh, uh, one called HBC 522 and another one uh, called 630 and uh, another one called uh, 692, which people are starting to hear about now. And I know they're only numbers and they're not as sexy as a good name, but... Um, it's yeah, not. we've got a few of those on the way, actually. So that's going to be looking forward to playing around with those um, in the brew pub um, for sure. Yeah. And we're not scared to, uh, you know, like I, I really enjoy a, a huge part of what gets me out of bed every day these days is just looking for that new way through, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really a fruit brewer or an adjunct brewer. Like I'm, I'm still struggling with four ingredients. So yeah. <laughs> luckily there's a lot of new hops. That, you know, um, and and I guess um, Scotty, um, going you know talking about IPA, why purple? It's a nice mate. Can you you let us know. This. Can you let us know why purple? I'll tell you why purple um, for the folks out there. So one night, either I think it was before or after Canberra Brewers meeting. It was probably after. I was. I was at the uh, at the bar at Wigan Pen with one Richard Watkins, and we were drinking a beer that he used to make in there called Venom, which I believe was the first double IPA I probably ever really drunk. It was also a beer um, that, as far as I know, it was the first time I'd ever had a beer that had um, Simcoe in it. And to me, that beer it blew my mind because it just purely and simply tasted purple. And... <laughs> I can remember Rich saying to you, go like, oh, that's awesome. Gee, it tastes really purple. <laughs> like, I must be pretty pissed by now. This is this is what a double IPA tastes like. This is awesome. So yeah, um, those, those lock-in sessions of the wig were pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dave, uh, we've got a question up there from you for you. Um, Keith asks, I pressure ferment at home and was wondering how brewers feel about pressure fermenting. Do they feel there's a benefit or – does it make and, and does it make much difference? That's a really, really pertinent question. We're, we're, we, I, I haven't in the past, and and um, when I, we've, you know, I, I, to be brutally honest, I don't do a lot of brewing these days. I've got a couple of guys who have come up um, up the ranks here who are brewing as good or better beer than I can. So, but one of uh, we we don't ferment under pressure. We um, obviously um, towards the end under cooling and so forth we do, but. During ferment, we don't, and there are, there are a lot of brewers that do, and there's, there's and um, but typically a lot of the American brewers didn't in the past. Um, but we're literally going to start doing some tests on that um, uh, on our test brewery over the next couple of months, just to see what sort of impacts that does have on our fermentation profile and characteristics and um, and taste profiles and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, at the moment, we don't, but um, it's something we're, we're actually looking into right now as we speak. So, a pertinent question. There you go. Well, you, we, we, we definitely do ferment under pressure. We yep. we generally ferment at about 0.4 bar for all our beers. Our and our lager, we generally ferment at about 0.8 to one bar. Um, we do want that extra pressure. Um, I find that we get a cleaner yeast profile with a bit of pressure there. Um, um, it does put a little bit of pressure on the yeast to to produce and and we definitely see those results in um, a bit of a cleaner ferment um, promoting certainly promoting sulfur compounds out of the beer um, a lot better um, Scotty are you are you got any thoughts on pressure fermenting yeah you know what I think that we've done it inadvertently all the way through because I know a couple of other guys who who um, sort of been in the same as sort of similar sort of size breweries or tanks and and yeast strains and similar sort of beers is what we make. And they sort of have asked, like, you don't seem to have the sulphur problems that we do. And um, and the only thing I've ever been able to put it down to, like the, like the only major difference, particularly using the same sort of yeast strain, is that, that we have, like, I'd always started with our 70 heck fermenters with, um, like, a, just a normal garden hose jammed on a disconnect as an airlock and there is some there is always some head pressure on there because it's just not it's not like the same as open fermentation so you also have some restriction of esters as well which probably helps in that cleaner profile you know and, and particularly 
it particularly helps with lagers. You know, they yeah. get a bit eggy and farty early on, but they somehow end up a bit cleaner. But with with all our beers, and that's only just because you know I had I had that bit of hose lying around to stick over a disconnect, and it worked. And then as as our tanks sizes have scaled up, I've tried to have a similar. <laughs> You know, a similar restriction, I suppose, going up in the same sort of way. So, yeah, um, it was never intentional. And I do know there's, you know, there's some guys around. Um, I know, um, you know, there's some some of the guys in San Diego, some some friends over there that that actually have, um, you know, every single tank regulated where they can actually dial that in. It'd be like having a spunding valve, I suppose. Yeah, well, we and have I- a spunding valve that we can set to whatever pressure we want. Yeah. Um, and so we, we lock all our tanks in at point four right at the start. Day day five and six, we go to one bar. Um, with our lager, we start at point eight um, and head head upwards, um, sort of seven day mark, um, one bar, 1.2 bar. Yeah. Um, Scotty, you've been asked this question a, a million times, but Ryan up there wants to know, um, always enjoyed the Boulder XBA. But he wants to know, and feel free to say pass if you don't want to answer it. He says, "How did Scotty get together with Fanning and Co?" <laughs> uh, yeah, I just—I actually got rung by some dude I didn't know from San Diego, actually, and it was like uh, I was kind of flattered because you know San Diego is fairly central to. The U.S. craft beer scene, you know, there's obviously Vermont's probably taken a, you know, the Northeast is probably taken a bit of a, a step forward now, but there was always sort of Denver and Denver and San Diego were these epicenters of American craft beer, and I was kind of flattered there was a guy from San Diego who wanted to talk to me about a brewery, and um, so we had a had a few chats, and it eventually was really uh, revealed that oh, there's there's a couple of guys and uh, you know a couple of people involved that. Might uh, might be a little bit well known, and I just sort of groaned and went, "Oh, fuck yeah, righto." <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. I thought retired TV game show host or something dumb like that. But anyway, it turned out to be Mick and Joel and Bede and those guys. And um, you know, it was. Uh, let me tell you, I didn't I didn't seek them out because I wouldn't know how to. They actually they actually <laughs> they they got on the phone and sort of it took a bit of work actually for him to get me across the line you know um i was pretty skeptical because i didn't want to i i didn't want you know i really i, I really love being part of the beer industry and I, I just didn't think it'd be a good idea to make another paris hilton based <laughs> blonde lager or whatever you know like that celebrity beer thing i thought no nah, that's not good for that's not good for beer. That's not adding anything, and it's probably it's probably really bad for my bank account too. Um, so I was pretty hesitant about this whole thing. But uh, once I'd sort of really met met the boys and we sat down and talked about it, like it it became instantly obvious it had nothing to do with them. It was all about um, we we want to be part. We want to build a, a great brewery and. Um, and we've heard that you know you might you might be the guy around here who's who's the, and the, you know the best fit for us and the best guy. You seem to know one end of a keg from the other. So um, do you want to be involved? And it went from there, you know. And it was, yeah, I don't know. It's it's really it's, it's just it's a weird story. But the weirdest thing about it is it's true, you know. That yeah, um, I you know, be pretty pretty proud. Um, yeah, I can't surf for shit. <laughs> it's just as well too. Uh, but you know, one one yeah, situation right? that I had early on was that, that <laughs> nah, not at all. <laughs> I was surprised. I, being a Byron boy, I thought you'd be a surfer for sure, Scotty, but Hey, do you want to know a story? Um this is and this is true, like everyone talks about Mick. Before get this, before um we even had a beer out, Mick had, had the J Bay incident, like people were all over the place going, oh, I've got a name for your first beer, mate, Shark Puncher. How about that one, mate? You know, like, so there was an awful lot of that. And we all groaned at that. But all power to Mick, he did punch a shark and 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 then went back the next year and, and took on his fears and actually won uh, uh, won the competition at, at, at J-Bay in South Africa. I pulled a <laughs> – I was in the surf at Byron here about six weeks ago about – 
Oh, between navel and nipple high, I suppose. And um, I ran out of the surf because I saw a shark coming and pulled a calf muscle. <laughs> 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 there we go. Um, Dave, um, well, Luplin, um, Luplin is, um, you know, a big product out there now and it's used in a lot of um, IPAs. It's obviously that concentrated um, Luplin balls and the oil and we here at Benspake, we use shitloads of it. Um, we use it in every pretty well every beer, um, certainly every IPA we do. Do you play around with Luplin? How do you, what are your thoughts on Luplin? We do. Um, I wouldn't say we use a lot of it. Um, I know there's a lot of brewers that are. I think it um, certainly helps with um, reducing, you know, particularly with the higher hop loads, you know, maximising the output and, and reducing some of those vegetal flavours as well. So we are playing around with it. We are starting to use more um, and play around with them more with the um, with the hazies as we're, we're, we're putting a hell of a lot more hops into uh, the hazy beers at the moment. A lot of late hops, um, so we're playing around with some of these sort of hop derivative products to try and um, try and cut down on some of the the burns, some of the hop burn problems that you can have, some of the um, some of the, um, the the volume problems that you can have. Um, but um, to be honest, not a lot at this point. No, um, we have uh, we have we 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 sort of one of those one of those projects. We have we have a lot of pro sort of side projects, particularly with our pilot brew that we work on, and that that's one of the projects at the moment to try and use those, particularly in our hazy beers. And Scotty, you got a little bit, I think, um, thinking last time you got a hop shipment in. Um, how's your loopling going? Yeah, I um, I was probably like everybody who had to go at the hop dust um, back a couple of years ago, and I threw it in the tank, and it pretty much bounced back out at me because it was <laughs> <laughs> hydrophobic. It's, it's more hydrophobic than a cat. So, um, yeah, it was pretty hard. And I went, um, yeah, I don't know if this, this stuff's a great idea, but obviously, uh, you know, they, uh, they went back and thought about it and was, uh, w were able to sort of get that pelletized and make it much more uh, easy to use. I'm, I've, I've got to say I, I really love um, some of the cryo and lupal and stuff um, going out there, but um, uh, it might be just me. I'm... I, I always need to to cut it a bit with with normal T ninety pellets to actually get the the cut cut through. You, they're yeah. very they're very refined and very elegant characters, and and I think they're best paired with a, still with a little bit of mongrel that you get out of a T ninety. That yeah, yeah well, luck, luckily um, Galaxy we use a bit of Galaxy, and luckily Galaxy is still um, only T ninety, so that's um. Yeah, and the same same with Amarillo. So that um, adds a little bit of uh, mongrel to all our beers, which we <laughs> use. Um, we use uh, the <laughs> the lupulin in because I I tend to agree. You do need a little bit of that T ninety vegetal character to sort of carry it through. Um, Dave, um, question for you up there. I love Corbin D when it comes out. What is proving more popular, that or lupulin fog? Now that it's had a few releases, double IPA or hazy? Yeah, look, it's. Corbin D is always a good one for us, and we, that's why we only we release that three times a year. So it's not a full time release. We try and make it a little bit special. Um, we do brew a lot of it, so it's not not a case of just putting a little bit out there and you know let it run out real quick. But it's something we brew it three times a year. We make sure that it's um, we that we brew enough of it. You know, a couple of big tanks. Make sure that everybody can get a go, um, and make just enough to make sure that we fill the shelves and that doesn't hang around too long. It's something um, we want to get into the hands of people fresh. Um, so it's a little bit of a balance, make sure everyone can get some and then make sure it doesn't hang on a shelf too long. So um, Lupal and Fog, um, if I made that more than once a year that I do now, I probably wouldn't be in business. It's uh, you know, one of those beers that just costs a hell of a lot of money to make. We throw a little bit too much hops in it. It's fun. We love it. Um, we put enough of a price on it. It's, pr it's pricey enough as it is, but enough to, to almost cover our cost. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's more of a, a beer we love as brewers to make and have fun and really love doing it just once a year. Do it for our birthday. Um, and that one runs out pretty, pretty, pretty damn quickly. But same thing. We do a lot of it. Make sure it gets on the shelves, off the shelves quickly, and um, then we'll wait till next year. Well, I think that's really important statement there, Dave. Um, and I share the same philosophy about double IPA is that um, everyone keeps saying, oh, can we put a cluster eight into our core range and, and do it, brew it all the time? But it's a beer that we do we do as well a few times a year, and we want to get that out there. We want to fill the shelves. We want to see that disappear. 
um, and then have people wait around for the next time because it is best drunk fresh. Um, it's so good putting a putting a you know a handgun on the on the bright beer tank and tasting it straight out of the tank. I think that's one of the best things about being in a brewery is tasting your double IPA straight out of the tank before it even gets in a can. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, Scotty, you 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 obviously do a double IPA too. Uh, are you? And, and I notice it's not available at the moment, um, so it must be a seasonal as well. Yeah, mate. We um, we we found with ours like um, when we first put it out, there was all this hysteria about it, and then it was probably partly because we had such beautiful looking cans as well. <laughs> but you know, and. Um, it really came down to us, like after, like we'd, we'd released it a couple of times, we tried to only do it like once or twice a year and we realised there's a, there's a natural level of uh, the audience is this much for that particular beer and they'll always be there. And it was like, well, we don't want to make any more than those guys will drink so that everybody there will get the best experience. We want to make it like um, Dave was saying, like you want to make them regularly enough so that people don't unfortunately go and hoard them and hang on to them for a year or two or and we've probably all seen that and it's it's a bit sad it's like we will make more you should have drunk that six months ago it's not going to be the beer that i intended or that you guys intended when folks do that you know they they sort of go wow it's 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 a little bit rare so i'll hang on to it. it's like no don't do that it's only it's beer it will We'll make more. We'll always make more. So, for us, with this year, with everything, with COVID and everything else going on, like we um, don't worry. There's a there is a, a, an IPA with another I in front of it coming coming fairly soon, hopefully from us. But again, we're going we're just going to do the same thing as you guys, like because the philosophy is all the same. Anyone anyone who really gives a shit about double IPA is is going to have that same and it you know, that same philosophy. And it's not about restricting it to make it more, uh, you know, like hyped or more valuable. It's just the fact that if you can match the audience to your output, then everybody wins, you know. You sell the lot, yeah. which is what you want to do, but everybody who actually wants that beer gets it fresh. And that's all I want out of our double IPA is like if you want it, you can get it. It'd be fresh as buggery and, you know, that, that there's only – hopefully only enough that it's not still hanging around in six months' time in the back of a fringe or, you know, or a bloody discount bin or some shit. Yeah, for all those people listening in, um, you know, as brewers when we see people, um, you know, going to the bottle shop and buying a whole range of beers, we get so excited. But what we don't get excited about is when we hear that those people with that range of beers are going, oh, I'm just going to put these beers in my cellar for six months. Um, and see how and see how they taste in six months' time. Um, you know, hop-driven beers are really important. That you, you know, literally, if you if you're buying a beer in Canberra right now from a bottle shop, by the time you get home, it's been like probably through the fridge because it's cold outside at the moment, and and people are coming in. You know, if you're going from the bottle shop to home, the beer's going to chill down. You should drink it when you get home. It's going to be the best it possibly can be, as fresh it can possibly possibly be. So. Those any beers with, with that, that are double IPAs, um, hazy IPAs, or just our normal IPAs, drink them fresh. Don't don't chuck them in the cupboard and come back to them in six months. Certainly, if you want to collect the the cans for the artwork, like Scotty said, he's got a pretty can. Collect them empty. Don't don't keep them full of beer because that doesn't do anyone any favors. I reckon. Um, Dave, how how do you feel about that? Do you love seeing? Um, seeing your uh, double IPA. And you've got your double IPA out at the moment, haven't you, Dave? Uh, yeah, well, I think, it should be, again, it should be should be running out pretty quickly. And, um, yep, no, we don't. nobody wants to see. It depends. You know, it's funny. IPA life cycle for us is um, once we once we package, we kind of we kind of like. I mean, if, if, if I wasn't running a business and it was all, you know, we didn't have to worry about it, I'd probably let it sit in a can for a week before we released it. We kind of see that little... Little, um, you know, it's what they call can shock. You know, those first couple of days, it's still an awesome beer, but we actually see a little bit of an improvement in that first week, maybe even two weeks, and that's when that. But after that, that's the peak, and that's when the curve goes down. And um, and yeah, hit the nail on the head with with our you know, all our beers. If we could do it with all of them, we could get them in the fridge, sold, replaced. 
But even with our um, our core beers, you know, the, the hot smith there in front of you, we're trying to make sure that our customers, our, our bottle shop customers, have one of those. I'll give it a taste for you. Good work. And not, and not buying too much stock because, yeah, we're making it all the time. We can get them fresh stock as much as possible. Don't buy. We're not going to go and sell them a pallet so that, they, you know, it takes them three or four months to go through it. We want to sell them five, ten cases, get through it in a couple of weeks, and then we'll restock them again because – that way, you know, the customers are getting the freshest beer they can. So. Yeah, we, we sort of try and pre-sell our, our double IPA, um, cluster eight, and try and, you know, get, get commitment from people to actually pre-sell it so that um, we know it's going it, to, you know, it's not going to sit around in our warehouse, but also, you know, it's fine to sort of get it out to distributors and stuff, but we want them to pre-sell it too so that, that it's going to them and then going straight out to their customers. I mean, a lot of the time you see... You know, you see distributors sitting on lots of beer, and I don't think that's a good thing either. So they, the the onus is on everyone. It's not just on our on our brewers. It's it's on the distributors. It's on all the retailers to make sure that they move those double IPAs on pretty quickly. Oh, mate, it's a whole supply chain. Like, there's a real, um, you know, <clears throat> the the best way I think for hoppy beers to move forward is that everybody understands. Uh, that they have a li- limited you know, lifetime, treat them like milk, you know. You're not going to drive, you're not going to go and buy a, 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 a two-litre, you know, carton of milk, stick it in your car, drive it around for a month, then put it in the fridge <laughs> or bring it home from the IGA and stick it in your garage and then put it in the fridge when you got room for it. But people think that you can do that with beer, like, you know, the I guess big beer has made that sort of semi-realistic, you know, or semi-feasible. But yeah. even those guys are like are, are cottoning on that that's not that's not good for anybody. That's not good yeah. for beer. It's not good for beers. Uh, you know, it's not good for beer's image. It's not good for the best enjoyment of your beer either. You know, like you know, we're living in funny times. So you know, I want the best out of my beers. So you've got to treat them like any other food product. And um, particularly, you know, the sort of beers we're talking about tonight. You know? Yeah, I'd love to create this, invent this, um, this little uh, uh, hop uh, schedule, little uh, meter that goes on the side of a can where if the can sits around too long, it sort of depreciates and you end up starting at 10, 10 hops on the side. And as the beer naturally ages, it, it goes down and down and down. And <laughs> when people walk into the shop and buy a, a one hop beer, then they're, they know they're getting dudded, and that'll be that'll be a bit more onus on retailers to make sure those beers move through. Or, a, sure. or, a, th- or a thumb that slowly turns. Yeah, <laughs> slowly turns exactly. Yeah, we could do something, no something like that. I mean, that's that's when you think about it. That's like um, you know, that's where um, guys like um, um, Greg Greg Cook and and uh, Greg Cook and and Steve Wagner at Stone like had that idea of enjoy by it you know like they put a lot of pressure on themselves to have uh chip beers that got i think three four months at the most shelf life yeah yeah we've got a question up there actually funnily enough about stone and um from michael uh and it's actually a yeast question on a hop night uh, maybe michael <laughs> you won't win the merch pack tonight but i think, <laughs> I think it's a good question um does ben spaker kasha bolt to have a go-to house yeast Example, Stone Brewing is well known for using WLP 007 in its IPAs and pails. Well, um, at Ben Spoke, we, we don't have a yeast propagation plant and we don't recover and reuse our yeast because um, dry hopping does make it a little difficult to re, you know, recrop your yeast and reuse it, having to wash that yeast and remove all those hot particles from the yeast the yeast does get a bit stressed with that, um, you know, those hot particles sitting around as well. So you're not going to necessarily get the, the best fermentation. And for me, making um, consistent beer is all about consistent fermentation and consistent fermentation is all about consistent yeast pitching. And so we pitch fresh dried yeast, US05, every time into every beer. Um, certainly every hop beer we do. Obviously, we don't use it for our lager, but... Um, that's what we do, Scotty. Have you got? Have you? You happy to to talk about yeast or feel yeah. free to say pass? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, we 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 do the same thing. You know, for the most part, um, you know, we we use um, we've always used dry yeast 
for the same reasons, mate, really because we didn't have the sophistication. I understood enough as a brewer to know that I'm always going to get consistent fermentations by pitching pretty much exactly the same amount of healthy yeast into the same amount of wort every time. And there's there's a lot to be said for that, you know. Um, <clears throat> I know there's some go getters out there who sort of, you know, start brewing and within about 20 minutes have got six or seven strains on the grow in their breweries and stuff. And then suddenly the beers are up and down. They sort of don't taste quite right and blah, 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 blah. And a lot of that's to do with that sort of, it's, it's a lack of respect for, you know, one of the major ingredients in in your um in your beer and and really the you know we all work really hard but the biggest workhorse in any brewery is probably the yeast strains that you're using so uh because without them we don't none of us get beer um and uh yeah so you know like i propagate um different strains up for our sort of smaller beers and limited releases and our hazy i use i actually use our pilot plant to propagate our hazy yeast um and that's always a bit of a process, you know. And that takes that takes planning and scheduling. And, and do you repitch that? Do you repitch your hazy yeast? Um, no, I'm just about to start to, because we're because um, I'm having to do it so often. Like it's a four day run up, you know. You've, yeah. you've got to you've got to pitch. You got to pitch some starter. You got to grow a lot of it. You got to get forty eight hours. You have got to send it up, you know, into ten times as much work do that again for another 48 hours and what I do is then split it into the tanks that it's going to go to and it's it's a fair bit of work to do that and if you're going to have to do that like you know like uh all the time then it gets a bit it's a gets a bit tough so like and it's great for us in a way because it's actually forcing us to address the one of the things I'd always wanted to do which was actually make sure that we had really a really good um rigorous sort of yeast pitching program that over over time will probably give us a bit of a house character i think with the whole like even with the stone thing like I'm, and um you know i i have my steve particularly because i know the guy and he's he's just you know they call him the godfather in san diego but those guys have you know i think the stone yeast is probably almost its own thing these days because they've yeah. they've made so much beer with it for so long it's it's probably not exactly what it was 20. That's right. It, I don't know. I agree with that. It's um, the stone yeast, even though 007 is the reported um, yeast that it comes from, is certainly not exactly the same as 007. It's certainly turned into Stone's house yeast and has that signature stone character to it, which I think is really important. Dave, what do you do with your yeast? I mean, I know you're a little different to us, probably. Um, how many different yeasts have you got flying around in your brewery at the moment? Uh, we'd, have, we'd have three going at the moment. Um, we've got uh, lager yeast, which we're doing not so much of at the moment. So that would be a fre- for us, if we're going to brew a lager tomorrow, to be a fresh pitch. I don't have any here at the moment. Um, we do reuse yeast when we can, but we don't. We try and part of, we, we've got a, a strong lab. We've got a guy here who's got a lot of experience in, in lab work. We won't do a repitch until we know exactly how much we pitch. We, like we do with dry yeast, if we've got a fresh pitch, we know it's pretty easy with a dry yeast to pitch the right amount. With our re, if we're reusing yeast, we're still measuring, we're counting cells, we're doing all the right things to make sure that we're actually pitching the same amount of cells as though we're doing a dry pitch as well. So um, we've got the equipment here to measure properly, measure, you know, make sure they're alive, make sure they're not dead cells and make sure that we're pitching about the same amount. We do find, and we've been spending a lot of time on that. We can, we've got the facilities to store a pitch uh, for a short amount of time. We won't store that more than about a week or, or, or two max. Um, but again, we'll measure before we pitch how it's gone. And a couple of times we've measured it. We've lost a few too many cells that we thought and we'd thrown it out and we've just done a dry pitch again. So we do do it somewhere down the middle. We do do it, but a bit very, very carefully. Um, we do find... Um, a, a good house yeast and most most of us is 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 uso5 or 001 or whichever they're all pretty much the same um that they do behave a little bit better after after a generation or two we tend to get a we tend to find that sort of particularly around that generation three we don't go too much further than about five or so um but they do behave really nicely after a couple of generations hey, but, richard, um, great. hey rich it's a pertinent question actually because particularly in the age of hazies and people talking about biotransformation and you know we talk a lot about hops but it's actually the interaction of hops and yeast that, that have been given people all the all the flavors that they want 
in these, um, <coughs> what would you call it? very, very modern IPAs, you know, and, um, yeah, um, there's nothing better than a really healthy, sexy, you know, London-style, London strain uh, ferment to make a great hazy beer. There's no doubt about it. Right? Well, let's move on to that. Dave, um, you've done a couple of hazies now. Um, Spalt has done a couple of hazies. Um, ben Spoke hasn't done a hazy. Um, <laughs> Is there a yet there is? I'm uh, <laughs> fine, mate. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm gonna say that I'm really struggling with the whole mud mud to haze thing. Dave, how do you make sure your hazies aren't mud like? Because for me, the whole mud like thing, the whole mud like thing where you've got all that yeast and hops and uh, um, floating around and it sort of settles out in the glass and forms that beautiful layer on the bottom of the glass that looks like a creme brulee or something. Um, how, how do you go about it? Are you happy to share some info um, to people who are watching tonight on on your hazies? Because, you know, Ben Spate needs a little bit of a hand here to get up to speed with, with um, everyone out there who's doing hazies. Look, um, I was going to ask you what you meant by mud, but I think I figured it out now, and it's yeast. And I think um, – and, I, and I, look – I would, I would I would say up front that we're certainly not experts in that. We've spent, you know, we've got 15 years of experience brewing West Coast. We still, you know, we still don't think we've got that perfect yet either. So hazy for us is a pretty new thing. And well, I disagree, Dave. I reckon the Hop Smith is a very great example um, of one of those West Coasts. Um, I'm really happy drinking that tonight. Thank I think you. Um, I think you've nailed that. I think you should move on to hazies. <laughs> So, so look, we've been playing around. We've, we've, we've. Um, one, of the, one of the things I will say is that the type we we brew, we've always brewed the brews, types of beers that we like, right? And we love West Coast more than anything. We also do like a good hazy, but I think the examples that have the mud that you're talking about for me is not a pleasant beer to drink. Um, we also don't like the overly sweet ones as well. So what what we're trying to achieve as a brewery is. Probably sits somewhere half, well, doesn't probably, sits halfway between a West Coast and an East Coast. We love the haze. We love the low bitterness. Don't necessarily love the high sweetness. Um, but we but we also like the body that comes with it as well. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. One of the things that we, we don't like in our beer is yeast. And so we make sure that we derive all of the haze from everything but the yeast. So all of the proteins and polyphenols and all the other rubbish that comes along with it. So so, so for all those brewers out there that um, make these great hazy yeast bombs, please take note of that comment. Hazy IPAs are all about the hop haze, not the yeast haze. When I was pouring this can the other night, I could nearly put it on my finger as a pendulum, and once I'd poured all the beer out of it, it swung back the other way because there's this massive yeast cake in the bottom of the can, which I didn't really want to put into my glass. So... Um, yeah, so you've got, you've got to get, you've got to get that brand. yeast out. You've got to get that yeast out, and um, and it's sometimes it's hard if you're doing a big thick hazy. Sometimes um, if you're not, you, if you don't have a centrifuge or you're not filtering or whatever else, sometimes it is a bit tougher. We've found with the with if it's a London based yeast, um, you've got a big thick beer. Sometimes it is a bit harder to drop that yeast out. It might take a little bit more time, but you've really got to. The, key is that the London uh, the London ale yeast is that double A two or something like that. Um, Oh, London Ale 3 is a common one that I think a lot of the guys in the States are using. Um, we've played around with a different, you know, we, you've got the, the original hazy yeast out of, um, you know, purportedly out of out of, uh, out of Alchemist, which is not that hazy anyway. It's not like a, a treehouse or a, or a trillium type hazy beer, but, um, you know, London Ale 3 seems to be a common common uh, and and there's a bunch of all the um all the years providers have their version of that and that seems to be one that, that works pretty well the bio transformation works well the haze works well um but as i said we we spent we've spent a lot of time making sure that these beers have very very little yeast we measure we measure the final yeast content in all, all of our beers um so um we make sure that that's not where we're where we're deriving our haze from and and you know in the early days we'd get the yeast out and all of a sudden it was clear so um, that meant we had to work harder on making sure that we're uh, we're deriving that yeast from uh, uh, sorry the the haze from other other areas other than yeah whether it's bio transformation the the high protein counts whatever it might be yeah Not cool <laughs> uh, for everyone out there watching on Insta it's going to reset in a 
few seconds. So please log back in. We're going to keep going for a little bit, I think, guys. So, um, Scotty, Hazy. Yeah, mate. You don't like the mud either. I know that. Um, I don't like the mud, no. no. But you, you don't mind the hop haze? What's your special... Uh, what are your special tips for brewing a good hazy? I probably need a few. I've probably got to do one at some point. Um, resisted it for a long time. Not sure we can resist it anymore. Um, we get asked too much for it from retailers, people who want to buy our beer. So sort of sort of got to make a hazy, I think, for them. Mate, find it find a way through. I I was initially I was I was quite similar to that sort of stance because I hadn't tasted particularly locally a lot of good ones. This is going back probably a couple of years now because there were a lot of hit and miss ones and it seemed to be unless you were under the sample port on the fermenter, you'd miss the best of this beer. And <laughs> I was getting not just chunks but clods of yeast and shit in my, you know, in my glass and went, no, nah, just no, this is not. This is not where we're supposed to be going. You know, this is not, this can't be the evolution of beer. Like, surely to get this turbid shit in my glass. Like, <laughs> we've worked so hard as craft brewers to, <laughs> to prove to everyone else that, you know, our beer is just, a, just as valid as the multinationals and uh, the big guys who are technically very good and all that sort of stuff. And we're just as good at what we do. We're just, you know, we're just smaller and different and slower and more passionate and all this sort of shit and then you dump that crap in a glass so i was really really against it and it and um it, it took a lot of work from um um Stirls, our marketing guy that he just basically he just <laughs> he just said you gotta make one he, he, go. well, he said, he, no, he didn't. He didn't say, I've got to make one. He said, he just kept chipping away at me. Is would you ever do it, Scotty? Would you like, and he just, he ultimately flattered me into it. He goes, oh, I reckon you can make a fucking really good one. <laughs> and I went, oh, I'll give it a go. Well, that's what everyone says to me, but I haven't made one yet. Um, we've yeah, made a few in the pub and they the same pretty thing, well. Though. The thing is, for me, though, like, I spent, I spent about a year watching all the really crappy ones and thought, and I just took my time. It was like, you know, it's just one of those ones when you you just don't put the ball in the ground and then whack it. you got to put the tee in the ground and you just got to go back and have a think about it. And then you got to make sure that everyone watching isn't going to watch you sort of hit this ball off sideways and dribble down the hill. So but that wasn't really what was behind it. But I really did want to make sure if we were going to do it, it was going to be a really good – but the most important word I want folks out there to understand is that it was going to be really stable, and we've managed to make really stable hazy. I've, um, in one of our, you know, a couple of our, our trips to the US, like th that I've been on in the last couple of years, I, I took hazy that was at its uh, already expired two or three days before its uh, at its you know best before date, and packed them in the suitcase and took them to the US and drove them around for a week and then, you know, pulled them out in, in you know, in front of a couple of brewers that I I respect pretty highly and the beers had behaved really, really well, you know. When we, if, they're, if they're at their end of date and you chuck them in a suitcase and put them on a plane and they're still okay, then that was proof to me that we were sort of on the right track. But the biggest thing for me was definitely that stability piece because that's what had put me off so many beers that were only like a few weeks two, three, four, five, six weeks old, and they're like, um, I don't know if it's meant to have clods in it anymore, you know, and that was a big part of it. And, and yeah, that shouldn't have all been derived from yeast or just as bad, like just, just you know, flour, you know, like plain flour put in whirlpool and all sorts of crazy stuff I was hearing about. And I was like, no, that haze should be mostly hot polyphenol character. And Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and and the right amount of proteins and the right, you know, the right, because that's how you're going to get, you allow the yeast, you get the right yeast strain with the right sort of hops that you want, you're going to get the biotransformation you're after if you've got the right water profile as well. And, um, you know, and you think about how you're going to get introduced proteins into your work, ultimately uh, you should be okay there and not end up with, um, yeah, that 
what do you call it, Rich? The 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 tipping, the, pendulum, the, the mud pendulum, the pendulum. Yeah, yeah. But the it comes back the other way once it's empty because there's that mud chunk in the bottom of it. Yeah, I mean, geez, mate, if you can't make it decent hazy, then give up. <laughs> All right, that's a challenge, Scotty. I'll probably have to, um, yep, suck it up and uh, do something about it, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we've got a question from Michael. Um, we're making hazy IPAs. How important is a centrifuge speed up output versus time in a tank to avoid the vegetal flavours? Treehouse, swear by four to six weeks. Whilst deeds are saying only two weeks. Oh, That's what? a pretty technical question there, Michael. Thanks very much for bringing that in. You might well be in the running for a merch pack there. I think that'll probably be in our top three. Scotty, you want to have a go at that? So so what was you saying? Time in tank? Time in tank versus um, centrifuge speed. Like are we are we rushing them through and 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 centrifuging them and keeping them cloudy through the centrifuge or like treehouse? Are saying four to six weeks in tank. I mean, four to six weeks for a hazy. Scotty, how long's your hazy taken? Geez, do you leave it in tank for six weeks? Is that tank one beer in six uh, weeks? I can't believe that. No, mate, we can't can't possibly do that. <laughs> we're at we're at about 22, 23 days at the best. Because you know what? If you use London, see that's the thing about London three. It's actually a very very flocculent yeast strain. Right, that's the whole point. That's why it's that's why it's evolved the way it has. Um, but if you're making um, ordinary bitters or you know or you know English pale ales or something, it's probably going to be spectacularly bright inside two weeks. When you're going to you fast forward to from probably 1930 or something to two, you know, 2020 and all the um, crazy hot bombs that we we do these days the, the yeast just behaves in, incredibly differently and no one knew no one really, really knew that we had this really this yeast strain that would make ultimately re- highly flocculent yeast strain that makes really bright beers has this ability to buy a transform transform particularly american hop strains from you know the exact opposite part of the world and this is what you get you know um yeah I hope no. um, that's answered Rusty Penny Brewing Company's question. The best tip to make stop the haze dropping out. I think um, the best tip there is to use the the right yeast. Make sure you have the biotransformation correct. Um, I'd probably add to that that I think Luplin certainly can help the haze a little bit for sure. Um, we find that that is a bit of a um, thing for our beers where we use lots of Luplin in. Um, so you know, our hazy will certainly, when we get round to it, um, will certainly have lots of lupulin in it. Dave, what do you got to say about that? Um, how how are you finding? What's your best tip for keeping haze in, in your beer? We're certainly not throwing flour in the uh, in the boil, though. Jesus, who does that? Really? Are there breweries out <laughs> there doing that? There are all sorts of things coming out of the stage. That's Apparently, a really shame something. because. All those bakeries out there need that flour to make the bread, and brewers are sucking it all up and chucking it in beer. I can't believe that. Yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? Well, I think um, look the the high high pro yeah lots of lots of uh, wheat notes. Um, we've played around with all sorts of different levels of those, but um, and the types of oats as well. Um, yeah, we, everything from the from the from the rolled oats you put in your porridge through to the um, to the um, to the malted varieties, and there's some good stuff coming out of some of the new malts. So places like Gladfield that are coming out with some malted, I think it's Big O coming out of those guys that um, we've just literally chucked in a tank in the last week. So it's interesting to see how that works for us. A lot easier to work with, a lot less stuck mashes, and um, yeah, a, whole, a high oat uh, content in the mash can be a bit of a uh, bit of a long day. So um, hopefully that will improve that for us. Well, it certainly improved it on mash days. So hopefully it gives the same result. But high proteins in the mash. Um, obviously, the bio transformation. So again, we've 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 um, played around with everything from you know pitching our first dry hop from on day one through to day two through to you know at the end of the fermentation to to see what difference it makes. Um, 
uh, but I think you know a lot of the a lot of the brewers are, are swearing by a sort of day two day three um, dry hop, and we played around with maybe making that a small dry hop, a big dry hop. There's all sorts of different ways you can do it, um, but the bio transformation seems to seems to like a bit of a dry hop um, a little bit earlier than we will with the West Coast. Yeah, well, we do that. I've always done that. I I can't remember. I think Scotty um, brought up the fact that at the Wigan Pen we used to make a um, a beer called Venom. Well. Um, that was a good beer. I, I love that beer. Um, but I remember what happened with that beer was when we stored it in our cool room in kegs, we wouldn't sell a lot of it being, um, you know, 7.5% um, IPA back in uh, the year 2002. Um, people weren't really in, into IPAs back then. Um, pale ales were really making a good hit back then. IPAs weren't really going that well. But what I found was that those kegs built up a bit of carbonation sitting around, and that was something that I didn't really technically know what was going on, but I knew that because that beer was dry hopped, it was causing me problems. Um, so, yeah, that whole biotransformation of, of actually um, converting, um, using those enzymes from the hops to actually convert um, those sugars and, and ferment them out. We add hops to every single beer we make on day zero. So day zero with the yeast, barley, griffin, that's the only hops we add. We don't add any hops um, dry hopping further than zero days. Crankshaft has zero day and seven days. Sprocket has zero day and nine day, I think it is. Um, Red Nut, zero day and 11 day. Um, Cluster 8 has zero day, um, seven day and 14 day dry hopping. So there they are, dry hopping regimes. You've heard it here. Um, I really believe in that zero day. I reckon it really does get that um, bio transformation happening and stops that, you know, that over carbonation in the can. We, we've had so little um, rejects or people coming in and going, oh, my beer was too over carbonated and the can popped out. Um, we've had so little of those because we've always done a zero day. Um, Scotty, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? I agree, mate. We, um, we zero hop our hazy. Um, the, I, 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 for me, it's yeast strain specific. I would, I, I wouldn't do it with American ale strains, but I'd certainly do with London strains. I think it's very, very conductive that way. Um, but I, I hear you. I, I guess the word that folks, or the couple of words that folks are sort of out there might need to know about as well is what, what you're describing is the 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 um you know is um hop creep basically where you have you can have um mlas enzymes in hops can actually you know um ferment residuals sugars in your beer okay and um i'm not telling you guys i'm telling folks out there but um that's the thing that i think all of us have probably just discovered at some point over the years because i can remember back when we were at the canberra brewers rich you know a bunch of us were always saying no i've got these really dry hot beers and geez they get dry in the kegs <laughs> 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 and that was why you know yeah. we've, we've all been we've all been doing it and we've all seen it and we've all like recorded it over the years and 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 it wasn't until i guess the rise the serious rise of here we go again IPA as a thing, and so many of us now put them in in packages from small breweries to mega breweries that um, that that that's how you feel the effects of it. Like it's it's one thing when you know you're a couple of dickheads as home brewers putting them in kegs and go, it's a bit dry. <laughs> it's a bit dry <laughs> that we put it in there two weeks ago to you know having you know potential the issues that you can have out in trade if you've got you know. Um, if you got trouble with your pack uh, from re, re fermentation or whatever, but um, yeah, yeah, very clever move, mate. Get it done early. I'll, the only thing I'd add to that is I have always and will always um, dry hop warm. I know there's a whole, there's lots of lots of varying, you know, as many there's as many views on how you dry hop as there is brewers, and that's the way it should be. Well, let's, let's, let's actually discuss that right now, one of our last things we do tonight, because we actually have gone an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. Um, that's really good. People engaged and want to listen to us talk about hops, so well, let's keep talking. But, I mean, how do you go about dry hopping your beers, Scotty? 
Um, basically, I've always had the um, I've always had the idea that there was uh, it's a horses for courses thing for me. Different varieties need to be used at different times. You know, like there are some varieties that I'll never throw in a kettle. There's also some varieties I'd never throw in a dry hop. There's some varieties I'd only do as a zero hop or an early dry hop or would only be used very late. Do you want to elaborate, elaborate a little bit there for everyone or um, you can keep it general if you if you want? Yeah, uh, I don't know how. Just throw an example up of each, each stage where you wouldn't use hop. Um, put it this way, um, Centennial, Cascade, those type of hops I would never use. Uh, I would never use as a as a really late dry hop. I would certainly never use those styles cold. Yep. Because without even knowing it, I used to, I used to, I used to find what I thought were diacetyl notes in beers that I did that with, that would suddenly magically disappear later on. What I didn't know is that that was hop creep. Um, that I was finding not necessarily like re-fermentation or a, 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 an increase in carbonation or perceived alcohol, but there was definitely like almost like the like a fermentation issue that I'd find in these beers. And I go, what is that? And then a week or two later, suddenly it was gone again. It was driving me mad, and it would be specific varieties and the Cascade and Centennials and 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 those sorts of ones from those lineages were were very very much part of that. So I always made sure that I would have, and here's another thing, I suppose, pretty much most of, not all, but most of the bolt beers have always been double dry hops. I know it's a thing now to put on DDH, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? People actually have yeah. to put DDH on their beers because it's so special, but we've done it for 20 years. But anyway, um, yeah. how, how do you find dry hopping beers? Um, uh, what's your process for getting all those hops into Hopsmith? Yeah, look, we're, we're warm as well. We've been a big believer since day dot that um, do everything warm. So um, I think Hopsmith, that's a triple dry hop, actually. It always has been. It's, it's just, we just find we get better you know, splitting it splitting it into a couple of different dry hops over a few different days. We get much better utilisation of the hops. Um, yeah, we don't. Yeah, we, we're a big believer in balanced beer as well. We don't over hop. I mean, we're, it's still West Coast, but it's not. You know, it's not out of this world. Um, so we we tend all of our beers are at least a double dry hop. Uh, even our lager was a double dry hop. <laughs> so it's just a. <laughs> it's just, it's well, just a better way. You know, we're we're. Uh, we're uh, we lager can... for everyone out there. If if you miss that, is <laughs> double dry hop. I reckon that you should put be putting DDH on the on the can. I reckon for that one. We we did we on one of our seasonals uh, about six twelve months ago we we called it a DDH for a bit of fun, but um, it's it, look it's uh, it's something we, we do for all of our beers we get better utilisation we're tradition we try, try quite traditionally through the top let it let it we don't recirculate um, I know I think Rich you're a bit, you recirculate your hops from what I remember but yeah we've got a, we've got a hop cannon it can fit it. about one hundred and eighty five kilos in it and we recirculate. Um, Certainly over six hours for their for the big beers, um, but because of Luplin, it does dissolve and does integrate into the beer pretty quickly, um, and that's how we do it. Yeah, we don't we don't open the top and chuck them in. We yep. we do recirculate because we want to get that those hot particles into really small particles. Um, so we're forcing them through a screen, um, which basically breaks them up into really small particles so you get the best surface area and the best chance of oil contact with um, those hops. Having said that, zero day when we chuck them in, we are chucking them in through the top. Um, it seems, um, you know, we've got a few fermenters with a nice little walkway around them and we only use the walkway to chuck in yeast and, and zero day hops. After that, we don't even need to get to the top of our tank. So, um, you know, a little walkway up there for... For one for one little one little part of our process um, seems a bit of a waste, but um, be a nice uh, place to wander on a tough day, though, mate, wouldn't it? It is. It is it's great to do a brew <laughs> store anyway. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, Glenoris has put in a fantastic question. Um, maybe he won't win a merch pack, but the question is: Is it possible to make a light hoppy ale, Dave? You've got a you've got a little hop uh, 
what do you, what do you call your little uh, little Hopsmith out there? Little Smith, of course. Little Smith, there we go. Yeah, so, <laughs> look, yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, uh, a, a small IPA or a, um, a lighter IPA was something that we, I resisted to, a bit like you with Hazy's, to be honest, but uh, resisted for quite a while. And, um, you know, I've always been a big believer in, uh, we talk about hot and malt balance and we talk about it um, in our in our brew, we talk about a triangle of balance and alcohol is a very important part of that balance as well. So we talk about alcohol, alcohol, molten hops and how they work together in an IPA. So it was, it was, it was, it was, it's tough um, getting the body. I think obviously an IPA um, uh, like that, we, we try and build the body a little bit. We use... We concentrate a little bit more on the malt build than we will with our other IPAs. We use Maris Otter in ours just to give it a bit more, a bit more flavour and a bit more body. Uh, we mash yeah. higher to give it to a bit more residual sugar and a bit more body as well, um, just to create some level of balance. Uh, what you don't want is that is a, is a watery IPA, and um, so you've really got to work hard on, on, on creating a, a good balanced beer with that low alcohol. So it's tough. Um, we think we've done it pretty well, but yeah. And Scotty, Captain Sensible, um, obviously been a bit of a hit for you guys. Um, it's a you'd have to say it's a hoppy light ale. Um, yeah, hundred percent. What do you reckon? Any tips for uh, any tips for 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 our, our view out there who's going to win a merch pack for that question? Um, yeah, it's just like uh, you know what? It's always apart from making a great pilsner, it's it's one of the biggest challenges you have. How do you make how do you make more, if not more from less, how do you make the same from less? And, you know, that's going to be ongoing, I think. Like there's so many, with all the crap that's going on now, you know, people isolating and having home gyms and I live in Byron and every time I do the lighthouse now, like you see people who you, you know that aren't there to exercise but they're just getting out and exercising their freedom, I guess. You, you can't run the lighthouse in knee-high boots but you know people are, <laughs> people, are, people are pretending at least to be healthier and part yeah, of you that can't, is, you can't climb uh, sydney harbour bridge in uh, knee-high boots and you certainly can't um get up Peltra tower in knee-high boots either or mount ainsley in canberra so absolutely um, it must absolutely. be a thing but they're gonna have a crack but you know like <laughs> under the premise of being healthy but there yeah, clearly is, you know, folks that just want to, you know, in normal times want to just sort of tone it down a bit. And I guess, I, you know what, the thing about Captain for me was I saw that we had, um, you know, because we struggled really early on to, to get enough beer on the taps because whatever we did have just got sucked up really quick out of the tap room. So um, eventually when we got there, we were able to... Um, you know, had a few beers on, and I thought, right. The one thing that I realised was missing um, from our, our range was like at one point there, I had like six or seven beers that were over six and a half percent or something, and there wasn't the lowest alcohol beer we had on the tap room. This is going back about three years ago. The lowest alcohol beer we had on the tap room was XBA, and I went, "That's just when that's we say <laughs> that, that's right." When we say, and we always have, and believe in it wholeheartedly good beers for everyone well that's actually not true we, we're not presenting that at the moment so um i went shit all right i've got to do something about that so i jumped on the pilot and, and made a beer and um and i remember one of the one of the other boys was saying are you in today and i went yeah i'm down on the pilot um i'm brewing a mid-strength beer and his name is captain sensible and it was just it just came to me while i was writing the text and then i was like right now i've got to work Work out what that actually means. You know? And why is it yellow? Uh, sorry? Why is it yellow? Uh, I don't know. That's a fairly sensible colour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not I'm not responsible for that particular colour. <laughs> but, you know, it's 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 just been, um, again, it was a beer like Dave mentioned, Maris Otter. Like, that's exactly what you do. You, you, you know, you want to try and um, fill out the mouthfeel and the palate and the sense of being, the satiating sense of having a nice beer um, without it being, uh, you know, a second or third prize because it's a mid-strength beer. I mean, if I'm pretty sure it's the same for all of us. Rich, and you've been making low-strength beers for shit the whole time I've known you and bloody good ones. If, if, if 
for all of us, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. If people choose to drink a beer, that beer in particular, because it just tastes good rather than the fact it's low alcohol or reduced alcohol or whatever, that's that's where you really win, you know. If people choose I'm to pretty be- proud of that, actually. Um, ben, uh, sorry, when I was brewing at Wigan Pen, we, we won best – we won the champion trophy for, for low alcohol beer um, at the Australian National Beer Awards back in the day when – we used to judge in lab cates sitting around a freezing, uh, um, um, you know, table at the University of Ballarat with all the uh, commercial brewers, the likes of the guys from CUB and Lion Nathan and, and Coopers for the like. And to knock all those guys off with uh, a low alcohol beer trophy um, was pretty special. Um, and it was all about what the Dave and uh, Scotty have said. It's all about creating flavour, like lots of moulding there. Dave, I, I used to use Marisotta in uh, in this beer called Lionheart Light. Uh, I think that was... Ah, uh, yes, I remember. Yes. You only get to name one beer after yourself, and uh, <laughs> that was the one I named after myself at uh, the Wigan Pen. But, um, yeah, it, it is all about getting flavour. And we, we actually got a lower cold beer now called Easy, and, um, and it was for fucking before Pirate Life did their Easy Ale too. I might just add, <laughs> we've actually put them on the spot about it. And they've sort of said, "Well, there's a brewery in Vic- there's a brewery in Tasmania with with Easy Ale. You guys weren't the first. We're just going to copy you because you're doing something all right, and and we need to sell our beer. So they're going to they're going to keep going with it. We were one of the the first um, um, breweries to actually have our beer around uh, Australia called Easy, and I'm happy to stick by that. But Dave, you'll be interested to know that we actually use Sabro in that, and we find that Sabro works really well in a low alcohol beer because it does give all those beautiful um, tropical characters, but those also those sweet hop characters. And, mm. and obviously low alcohol beer, you haven't got a lot of um, residual sugar there to, to, to play with. And having some residual sweet hop characters does work really well in a, you know, a, a lower alcohol easy. A um, few questions just to fire off and finish off with, but um, Damien from Farrell, Scotty, the cake fridge behind you doesn't look compliant. We might move on from that one. Patrick says, how would you rate the difficulty of brewing IPA over other beers? I think that's a really good question, and it's actually one I had on the list to ask these guys. So I actually rate IPA as a, as a beer challenge in a brewery. I think it's um, it, there's a lot of IPA out there now and a lot of brewers doing IPA that probably don't know enough about making IPA. I think IPA isn't as easy as what it seems to make, and I think um, – a lot of brewers need to probably understand a lot more about hop blends um, and what works together. Um, it's sort of, to me, like making a curry. You know, there's lots of spices that go together really well and there's lots of spices that you don't mix in with, with in certain curries, you know. So you've got to learn about that whole, if you want to make a Malaysian curry versus Sri Lankan versus an Indian, they're different spice mixes there. And it's a bit like IPA. There's certain hops that go together really well. Dave, how do you how do you find that analogy? Um, you know, getting getting hop blends versus spice blends. I like it a lot, mate. I'm going to steal it straight from you. I'm to use it. I'll use that another time. But um, being a uh, being a big, uh, I, I love cooking as well, so I, that really resonates for me. And and it, and it goes back to I think we were talking about it right at the beginning. Here. We 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 spent a lot of time with a hop on its own as a single hop, rubbing it, putting in a hop tea, brewing with it as a single hop IPA, understanding its characteristics before we even make a decision as whether we're going to blend it with something else. So um, you've really, it's like any, you've got to understand that in a, you're making a curry, you need to know how those things work together. And um, and like anything, it just takes practice as well. Um, you know, I, I, I've brewed a lot of IPA <laughs> over the years and, and as I say, I've still, you know, thankfully still got a lot to learn, still, still learning things every day. I've got... Younger guys brewing for me now that that are that are coming to me with ideas that I'd never thought of that are that are that are absolutely amazing and um, you know this this IPA thing is moving as well I think where we're sitting at the moment um, you know we love West Coast there is no doubt about it that's what we do um, but we kind of love hazies as well and we're kind of finding this little middle ground in between I think there's this real uh, really nice blur in between where yeah you know, it's a little bit hazy it's still a little bit dry. Um, the bitterness has backed off a little bit. Massive dry hop flavours. I think there's, um, it's 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 pretty exciting right now. So, but until we we won't we won't just go and throw a few hops together until we really understand what to, what each of them can do. 
And Scotty, do you do you make curries at home, or are you you more about mixing hops? Ah, hell yeah, I love curries. I love, I love, I love the fact that you can have something that you throw in the hot pan and go, oh Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> but then you keep going and you keep going and you add the layers and you bring in the complexity and you bring in the components that you need and you bring it all together and there you go. Suddenly you've got. There you go. That's the aroma I'm after. Like that's that's the flavour and the character I'm after. Like because if you judge one column of of aroma or one component on its own, it, like individually and isolated, it might be shit house. But that's that's always the beauty of brewing and like most things in life. It's like it's how you um, <clears throat> how you add these components together and in what structure and in what amounts. That's that's where that's a, difference between me doing paint by numbers and and picasso you know is is the difference in the ability to to say this much of that and this much of that and how i put it together and when and how i do it you know as an old <clears throat> as a former muse i suppose something i was really bad at um by the way but i always i can remember like one of the most important things i heard was like you need to play the space in between the notes. And I didn't know what that meant, except I realised now it meant shut up, basically. <laughs> basically, that's, that's, that's the truth. That is the truth. If everything is too loud and too busy, you get nothing. You get brown. Add all the, add all the colours on your palette together and what do you get? You don't get something spectacular. You get brown. And, <laughs> and not as good as the brown you would have brought as a, as a single colour, you know. So you've got a brown can coming out, have you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, favourite IPA around the, you know, around the traps. Um, let's talk about our favourite um, IPA in Australia and um, Ben Spake, Bolter and Akasha are, are no go. so you can't talk about any of those beers. What's a favourite Australian IPA you've got out there apart from our three and maybe also... One of the inspired IPAs you've had overseas, Dave. How, how are you seeing those? Yeah, I was going to I was going to start with overseas. I've, I've um, was lucky enough to spend some time with the Alchemist last year, or actually earlier this year before I went to shit. But um, we we got a new canning line beginning this year, the same one that the uh, the guys at the Alchemist were using in in Vermont, and spent some time with them. Um, their beers, I I, I, I actually. When I was thinking about the beers that I that I used to drink in the states, I remember drinking one of their cans a long, long time ago. They've actually been around for, I think it's something like seventeen years or something. Um, and their IPAs are just are just absolutely stunning. Um, probably more importantly, these guys are every single person I met from from the from the yeah you know, the guy who runs the joint down the guy who's sweeping the floor. Absolutely love what they do uh, and are passionate about the beers, and it really shows in their beers. So. Uh, from an international perspective, um, the IPA is coming out of the Alchemist. You know, obviously Hetty Topper, uh, and some of those beers are, are absolutely amazing. Um, Consider the the original hazy, if you like, um, and yeah. drinking out of a can, which was always a always a funny one. You know, I was always taught, ah, don't don't fucking drink out of a can. Pour it in a glass, but on the right around the rim of this can says, don't waste one ounce of aroma. You know, drink it right now, straight out of the can. Um, Australian, I think we're seeing some um, some good. Some good beers coming out of, of a few of the smaller guys, I think. Um, I'm lucky enough to be very good friends with with a good mate of mine called Ben Miller, who who, who has a, a very small. Well, he doesn't even have a brewery, but he's a he's a brewery. He's actually um, there's a couple of from Ben beers you may have seen over the last couple of months. And um, again, it's just a, a guy who's spent a hell of a lot of time understanding what's going on. He's he's brewing hazy beers as well. Um, and I, I guess you can see that I'm sort of I'm perplexed by the, these new age guys and what they're doing and, and some of the passion that they've got, even though it may not be my favourite style. Um, but he's brewing um, some amazing IPAs, hazy IPAs. And, and again, not focusing too much on um, what I've found are the best hazy brewers are the ones that are not focusing on how to get it hazy, but focusing on the beer and how it tastes. All right, hazy should be a byproduct of the beer. Yeah. Right? And um, he's he's doing some pretty funky stuff, so I'm I'm loving what he's doing at the moment. Scotty, what do you what do you got to say? You've um you got a couple uh, couple of favourites. Yeah, mate, there's some good guys around at the moment. Um, Dave, I don't know if um 
This little beer's been around for a while. Yeah, yeah, it certainly has. They're nearish neighbours to you guys. Yeah, up the road. Yeah. That Griff. Kingy and Glenn, good, good, solid. Big Sir is just a wonderful, I reckon, just solid fucking day in, day out West Coast IPA. Um, DJ up on the hill, up in the Blue Mountains, is, um, <clears throat> who was the original brewer at Motors Operandi, like doing yeah. his, like he always does, like does a great, bloody great job, great job of beer. Bloody um, great hazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's all about the hazy. He is now, you know, he wandered around for a while and was not doing him. Um, everyone should probably keep an eye out on Dennis at White Bay as well. Yeah. He'll come into his own. Like He's he's another one who uh, uh, came out of, of Modus, actually. Like, but, you know, he'd spent some time at Stone and Wood. Another, he's my phone brother. He's another one of these... Uh, I don't know, I seem to have an affinity with expat Americans out here at the moment, but um, there's some there's some really good good guys doing good shit for the right reasons, and not just because of beers new or in or interesting. They're doing it because they just are long term brewers, and they just <clears throat> they're like we are. You know, they're compelled to do this. They yeah. don't actually have a choice. This is not a job. This is what you have to get up and do, even if it wasn't a job. That's what you do, you know, and that's what really inspires me about those guys and it's great to see in them. Um, overseas, Rich, you remember being at um, um, Cloudburst? Cloudburst? Cloudburst guys make sensational beers from bloody stupid-ass American versions of Italian pills to hazies to weird-ass stouts, whatever. They've got they've got a lot going on. Um, um there's those guys, uh, you know. Obviously, some of the some of the bigger and more professional versions that uh, uh, Matt Brunelson and all his crew at Firestone Walker are always going to be top notch. Let alone Steve and the and the Stone guys, Pizza Port guys in San Diego. San Diego for the folks out there. Now that we're talking hops, like don't ever forget about San Diego. But like, if you get a chance, go there and have a look. It's more than just. Um, you know, the backdrop to the, um, um, you know, a couple of Will Ferrell movies. Like, there's some sensational beer out there. And one I would, I really want to mention would be, um, if you do get a chance to go to San Diego, go see Jeff Bagby. Jeff Bagby was one of the original um, brewers at Stone yeah. back in the day. Um, he was a very, very early on in Pizza Port as well. Now he's got a sensational um, brew pub that, um like everybody doing it tough, but I'm sure they'll come out the other side because his beer's so good uh, in the ocean side in in um, in San Diego. Like, uh, and just on Jeff, that like he's just a guy who who can do all of all of the shit now, but can also make probably the best Martin you've ever had. Probably can make the best Belgian gold nail you'll see on the west coast of the US. You know. Um, I really admire guys who have, um, you know, a lot of a lot of clubs in their bag. Yeah, that's definitely. I agree with you, Scotty. I think um, having certainly having a bows um, bows in your um, in your saddle there um, is pretty pretty good. You got to be able to make a few different styles of beer. But um, for me, I think the best IPAs I've had. Um, I definitely massive shout out to Vinny from Russian River. Um, yeah. For me, he probably mostly pioneered IPA um, in, in the US, on certainly on the West Coast, um, along with Matt Brindleson. Let's not forget him from Firestone Walker. Um, he's, a, he's a legend in the game as well. But Vinny certainly um, has um, really set the world alight with his IPAs and still doing it really well. And we've, I've been lucky enough to go there. If you're going to a trip to the US, which you can't do at the moment, but hopefully you can do in about five years, you should go there and um, make sure you get to Vinny, Vinny's Brewery because um, it's one of the best um, IPA examples, certainly um, going back in time and, and where they started. Closer to home, I'm going to be a bit parochial here. You know, Capital Brewing here in the ACT, Wade Hurley, um, originally from San Diego, they're making great IPAs too. And the Big Drop Double IPA um, is 
really fantastic um, expression of that style. And I reckon it certainly had a San Diego influence there. So big shout out to Capital and uh, Wade Hurley as well. Look, we're going to keep going, guys. Um, the battery's gone low on the camera. We're about to flake out after an hour and a half. So um, I'm going to quickly run through a few questions. How about a collab? Well, we get asked that every Bent Brewers live. So we've got about 14,000 collabs, um, I think, in the pipeline. Um, Andrew Hammond, not sure if, if this was asked. What's your favourite IPA? We've just done that. Tristan, what are your thoughts on Nipahs? We've definitely clubbed Hazy's tonight. Zero day at what temperature, Richard? Um, we pitch our yeast and everything at 20 degrees. Um, so we had our zero date at 20 degrees. Um, ben Adams, do you guys source majority of hops from the US or Australia? Um, I think um, I'll speak on the behalf of Scotty here and Dave. We do use a lot of US hops. Um, having said that, the Australian, Australian hops um, are good as well, and we do use a lot of those as well. So it's probably a bit of a combo. Um, what's the most experimental beer you've ever brewed? Shit, I'm going to have to go back to the guys on that. Hopefully the battery lasts. Um, Scotty, what's the most experimental beer you've ever brewed? Was that at the Sunshine Coast Brewery, maybe? Um, yeah, it's probably in my garage, actually. I tried to make a vegetable beer at one point with beetroot and shit in it. I tried to make a, beach, a beetroot schwarz beer. And I, I don't know. I'm a, I think I was. I did a beetroot Berliner Weiss one time at the Wig, and it turned out pretty, pretty purple. It was um, it was a good. Beer. It wasn't a bad beer. It was fucking earthy. <laughs> That's what I thought. I was thinking, like, could I just make it just that little bit more? Put it this way. I remember when when I was like still a concreter, and I I made this beer based solely on the colour of Angus Young's guitar, and it was a Munich Dunkel, and it won a. I won a fucking gold medal at the Canberra Brewers competition thing, and I went, "What if I made a beer that was just a little bit more purple?" Because <laughs> it was. I've given up on beetroot beers because it tends to, um, it tends to, when you go to the toilet, it tends to remind you that you might have problems. So I've given it up. Um, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Dave, what it, what's the most experimental beer you've done? Oh dear! Like I got nothing on you two, so it's only going to sound shit house. But uh, but I think look, like commercially, we 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 start we try and push the envelope on uh, on a few of the bigger beers. We've we've done um, we did a quadruple IPA. We're planning on on a next level after that as well. Just trying to trying to get out of the out of the box a little bit, but try and make these things actually drinkable as well as as opposed to a fucking beetroot beer. But but uh, so you know we we're, we're, we're trying to we're trying to pump out. Uh, probably stuff we'd normally do, so maybe a little bit boring compared to your guys, you guys. But uh, but trying to make a, a quad or a, or a whatever five is and and make it drinkable, so you can have a couple of schooners is uh, it's a bit of a challenge for us. Fantastic guys, thanks for um, celebrating IPA Day with us. Um, hope you guys have had a couple of IPAs along the way. Hope everyone out there has enjoyed um, the chat on hops and beer and and beetroot. Um, I didn't think we'd be talking about beetroot on IPA Day, but there you go, we did. Um, we're going to be right. back in a few weeks um, with Bent Brewers Live. We're going to be talking in all German beers. Um, we're going to be talking about the history of beer and all German beers. Um, once again, though, big shout-out to Dave and Scotty for coming on and giving up their time. Two of the, most, uh, the best IPA makers in Australia. So if you haven't tried any of their beers, and I'm sure you all have, but get into the shop n near you and try their beers, especially the double IPAs. Dave's got his out at the moment. Scotty's is coming out soon. And at Ben Spoke, we've got this little baby here that's going to come out pretty soon as well. Oh, there's a few hops that have come down as well. It's raining hops here. Cluster rate's coming out in a few weeks. So get on board with that. Um, get Dave's um, double Corbin. Get Scotty's um, double IPA as well. Thanks so much for, for tuning in tonight. Let's hop to it. We'll see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>